So we're going to change gear a little bit and try and forget how awesome JP6 is, and we're going to talk about serverless. So, um, and this is going to be a much, much shorter talk. I've kind of run out of time in the first one, so I'm going to keep it really quite short. We can drink it this one So, um, So serverless is a kind of a new, trendy, cool term. Some people hate the term serverless, by the way, because people say, but there's always servers there. Serverless, there's still servers. How dare you call it serverless? So the idea behind serverless, it, it really came from, well, Lambda from Amazon is the latest incarnation that got the serverless meme going. And the basic idea is, with serverless, is there's obviously still servers, but the idea is you as a developer don't know or care about the servers. You focus on your code, and Amazon Lambda, for example, will invoke your code, and it hides the nodes and the containers and the load balancers and all that kind of stuff. So the idea is very simple. It's, a, it's kind of an abstraction. You write some JavaScript or Go or Java or whatever, and you say, here's my code, and it runs your code in a serverless fashion where you don't have to manage the containers and the nodes and the Kubernetes clusters and all that. Now, it's kind of interesting. If you look back over the last kind of decade, there was Google App Engine, which was basically Amazon Lambda, but it never quite took off. People were like, that's a bit weird. It's bad. It's kind of odd. It kind of kills your request after two seconds, and it's kind of these, all, these, all these limits of how much CPU you can use. It's a bit weird. So it took a while for the industry, and Heroku came along and they did something kind of similar with the dynos. And it's taken us a, long, a little while as, a, as an industry for us to kind of go, actually, the serverless thing, that's kind of cool, because I can just write a function, and I can just chuck it into the cloud, and it will invoke me. And in many ways, the big innovation that Amazon Lambda did, <coughs> they added a billing model, a per second container invocation billing model, and they made it so cheap that if your function was invoked a million times, it, they would charge you like a dollar. <coughs> so most people's functions would be invoked a hundred times and you would basically not pay anything. So the really interesting thing about Amazon Lambda is, it's a billing model. It's per second per container billing model, which is really attractive to a lot of workloads. Now, there's lots of these heated debates on, on, the, on the Twitterverse and the internet and things about, which one's going to win? Kubernetes or Lambda or serverless? Is everything going to be serverless one day? And everything? And it's kind of a lot of kind of heated debate over nothing, really. Under the covers, all of the serverless providers, so Amazon, Google, Microsoft, all do a serverless functions or function as a service, which is basically, here's my code. Can you invoke me over HTTP when a request comes in? And just build me per second per container. Right? And you manage the load balancing, elastically scale up and down. You do whatever you want. Just bill me per second per container, which is really nice and simple. Um, really, all that's happening is there's a backplane that's managing these containers. It's putting your code in a container and it's doing a load balancer on the top, which is all the stuff Kubernetes does for you as well. The slight difference is you kind of, with Kubernetes, Kubernetes expects you to kind of know about all this, this JSON and YAML to do that stuff. So you can absolutely do all the stuff that Amazon Lambda does. The main difference between serverless and uh, Kubernetes is more of a UX. The lovely thing about Lambda is it's really simple. You just write some JavaScript and you poop it over to Amazon Lambda and boom. Although in many ways, that's not quite true. If you write some JavaScript and you poop it over to Amazon, that's great, but then you can't invoke it. So then you have to get the, uh, the Amazon API gateway out and you have to try to figure out how to expose that container as a uh, restful URI that you can then invoke, which is, not the easiest thing to use in the world, but it's generally fairly simple, right? Fairly simple. So there's this kind of two kind of spheres. Some people really love the serverless and think serverless is the future. It's going to take over. It's the future. It's awesome. A lot of other people are like, well, Kubernetes is it's awesome. It's the future and whatever. Really, it's not quite so black and white. There's kind of a gray bit in the middle that I'll talk about in a second. But in many ways, the, it's about what abstractions do you as a developer see? Like Lambda is great because you write a piece of JavaScript. But there's no service mesh, there's no persistent volume. You can get some environment variables, but it, the, contra, the API contract is fairly simple. One of the lovely things about Kubernetes is this massive ecosystem of middleware and tools, for something called Istio and Glue that do this service mesh and auto load balancing between microservices and auto TLS encrypting between all of your pods talking to each other. There's all this amazing tech you can use if you want it. The question is, do you need it? That sometimes you just want a piece of JavaScript that runs when you invoke it over HTTP, in which case, Amazon Lambda is awesome. If you need three microservices that are quite tightly coupled to each other, that are, are correlate together, and want to use a database in the same data center and stuff, maybe containers are easier for you to use. If you want to deploy your own version of Elasticsearch, Lambda is not really going to help you there. Um, 
So it does depend on really what's the workload. Sometimes we get a little bit too carried away with the billing model. Amazon Lambda is awesome. And if it fits your business model, great. Amazon Lambda is awesome for reasonably and frequently invoked functions. If you invoke a function a few times a day, sometimes a lot, but mostly not that much, Amazon is perfect. If you are a massive detailer, you don't want to serve your homepage on Amazon Lambda because it'll be really expensive. Amazon Lambda doesn't really work for massive high volume things that runs all the time because it's cheaper to run containers because they're always running all the time and they can do thousands of requests concurrently per second and they're kind of cheaper. So a lot of this is a billing model, it's not a technology thing, it's what's the best billing model for your software. What I'm kind of hoping is as the cloud matures a bit, a lot of this just kind of falls away and the cloud provider bills you the cheapest bill based on what actually gets invoked. Because as humans, we can't really know until we try Kubernetes versus Amazon Lambda, which one is the cheapest? Like nobody really knows until you just try both and then you look at your bills and go, oh, let's not use Lambda for this. Or let's definitely use Lambda for that one because oh my God, look at all these nodes. So I think one of the things soon, I think increasingly, well, what I'm hoping is Kubernetes and serverless conceptually merges. So it's really about, do I want to give Kubernetes a bunch of JavaScript, well, the cloud, a bunch of JavaScript and it just does the right thing? Or do I really want to peel back the curtain and use all of the amazing Kubernetes stuff you can do? Horizontal pod autoscalers, Istio service mesh, I mean, there's all sorts of amazing stuff you can do. But some people just want to write some JavaScript and have a function in both. So for me, I, I don't see this as two sides competing. They're two amazing tools. They're both basically using the same containers anyway. So your container that's running in Kubernetes, you can run in Lambda and vice versa or you know, Google Cloud Functions, Azure Functions, all of them take containers now, all of them take multiple languages and runtimes, all of them you can take the Cloud Function runtime and run it on Kubernetes, and you can take the Kubernetes thing and run it on containers and, and Lambda and vice versa. So please don't get too sucked into this heated internet debate of which one's gonna win, because they're both gonna win. It's kind of a stupid argument. It's more about what's the best platform for your workload. And one thing that neither of them do yet is tell you the answer for your workload. It's up to you to try them both to find out which one is the cheapest. Because it's really about, it comes down to cost, right? Um, to be fair, one thing that Kubernetes doesn't quite do on the public cloud, which it should do, is a lot of people use this term nodeless, okay? Which if you hit serverless, you can hit nodeless even more, I think. But the idea of nodeless Kubernetes is it's Kubernetes, but you don't have to worry about the nodes. So Kubernetes cluster generally has a bunch of nodes that run containers, right? So nodes are the machines, VMs, that run stuff. Really what we all want is to hide the nodes. We just wanna say, Kubernetes, run my stuff, and it runs your stuff. Whether it's Fargate or ECS or Lambda or whatever, nobody really cares. All we care is you use the cheapest one. <laughs> Whichever one is the cheapest and runs my actual workload, please use that one. Really, it, life's too complicated, especially on Amazon. On Amazon, you have ECS today, you have Elastic Beanstalk, Imagine you're a Java person. If you're a Java person, you've wrote some Java code. You could use Beanstalk, you could use ECS, you could use Fargate, you could use EKS, you could use Amazon with Cops. And who knows which one's cheaper? Nobody really knows. And you've got to really try them all to find out, I just want to run 10 Tomcats. Which should I use? And there's no real answer. What we kind of want to do is go slightly more meta and higher level and just say, I've got some Tomcats, please run it, Amazon, and you tell me whichever's cheaper. And it basically uses uh, metrics to decide based on your workload, maybe it will use Lambda when it's not running very much, and then it will switch over to Kubernetes when it needs to and vice versa. So please could, don't get too hung up, hung up on serverless versus Kubernetes. I kind of see them as integrating over time and just becoming a logical backplane of stuff uh, where you can deploy your code. However, there is a thing I want to talk about tonight as well, which is there's something in the middle. You, there's a way of using serverless on Kubernetes. So one of the big, uh, lovely things about uh, serverless and Lambda is I can write some code and I can give it to the serverless engine and it will run as many or as little of my apps as is required and it will just scale up and down automatically, right? That's really the sweet spot of Amazon Lambda. <coughs> is that plus the billing model, but then the billing model is based on how many nodes you run anyway to whether you use Kubernetes or Lambda. So the real uh, meat in this is can we have a way of writing functions in any programming language, Java, Go, Node, whatever, and having a way of invoking those functions, those REST endpoints, or whatever it is, over HTTP. So there's an open source project called Knative. Uh, so Knative has been around for about a year or two, 
Uh, it was started by Google, but there's a lot of uh, like Cloudbees contributes, uh, IBM, Red Hat, Pivotal, there's a whole bunch of different people contribute. Um, let me quickly show, oh, could you pop the screen on, please? That this is the Knative, knative.dev is the website if you want to read more about this. So it's an open source project, and it's basically a way of having something that's like Amazon Lambda that just runs on top of any Kubernetes cluster. So what's really nice about this is if you can't use the public cloud because you have to use an IBM or an Oracle or a Pivotal or an on-premise Kubernetes cluster, whatever, you can get the similar <coughs> effect of using Amazon Lambda. In other words, you just write some code, you give it to Knative and it runs it and does elastic scaling, but you can use literally any Kubernetes cluster. Now this doesn't mean don't use Amazon Lambda, but this just does mean if ever you have a Kubernetes cluster, you can treat it like Amazon Lambda, and you can treat this, you can use this serverless development model. Now, one thing about Knative, it's slightly confusing. One question. Sure. Knative, great, yeah. but there are a lot of solutions for functional and service. What makes Knative better than the others? So Knative is the one thing that runs on Kubernetes. The other ones are SASIs, really, or PASIs. PASIs. So Amazon. Service. So I've, I've seen open PAS or stuff like that. There's OpenFAS as well, yeah, sorry. Okay, o apart from OpenFAS, and there's one or two others, most functions of service are you know, Oracle, Google, Microsoft, IBMs, which most of them are public services. OpenFAS is different. OpenFAS is a competitor to Knative, but it's functionally similar. It just has less community behind it, but it's functionally similar. So they're both functionally similar. Um, if I had to pick one, I'd go with Knative personally. But they're functionally similar. So OpenFAS is slightly different, so you're right. Op there's OpenFAS, there's, um, there's about two or three other ones. However, everything seems to be consolidating quite quickly in this space. So, um, yeah. But OpenFAS is definitely another implementation. So there's this, and there's OpenFAS, and there's one or two others that are gradually morphing into Kinetic. But yes, OpenFAS is good. OpenFAS runs on any Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. So it's not just Kinetic, but I would, I would uh, I highly recommend Kinetic. Um, so Kinetic is good, but there's a few other implementations. What's interesting about all of them, though, they all work in basically the same way. You define a, 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 something called a custom resource in Kubernetes, which is like a, in Kubernetes, you can extend the resources there, so you can define a serverless function. There's an open files version, there's a Knative version. You can even have in the same cluster, open files and Knative running together, and you can have some functions in open files and some functions in Knative, and it all just works, it's all fine. So, one of the lovely things about Kubernetes is it's composable. You can use any middleware from any vendor, OpenFAS or Knative, all in the same cluster at the same time. It's all fine. So yes. Uh, so uh, the main difference between Google Cloud Functions and Amazon Lambda and uh, Azure Functions is that those are pure SaaSes that are run by one of the big clouds. OpenFAS or Knative runs in whatever Kubernetes cluster you have, right? So that could be on-premise, it could be you know hybrid cloud, public cloud, private, whatever. Um, now, Knative is slightly confusing. It's got three different bits to it. Um, there's a Knative build, serving or serve, and eventing. And what's also interesting is the build bit is going away. So the build bit started off as a kind of a simple CI pipeline thingy. The build part is how do we take source code and turn it into a container that can run on, on Kubernetes? Kubernetes can only really run containers. That's really all Kubernetes does. Kubernetes doesn't build containers. It doesn't do CI. Kubernetes just says, we will run containers. That's what we do. So Kinetic Build was the first experiment at how do we add like the concept of a build pipeline into Kinetic so we can build new images. So we can give you some JavaScript code or Java code to make a Docker image. Um, since the build part of Kinetic came along, there was lots of things happened. Um, so Google started a new project that was initially called Kinetic Build Pipeline and then now that's got renamed because that was way too confusing to say Knative Build Pipeline out loud. Uh, so now it's called Tekton, T-E-K-T-O-N. So now the open source project that was Knative Build and then became Knative Build Pipeline is now called Tekton. So Knative Build is kind of going away and Tekton is the new canonical way of doing CI and CD pipeline. Uh, just out of interest, Jenkins X is also a contributor and the cloud is a contributor to the Tekton project. Jenkins X completely supports Tekton. So when using Jenkins X, you can choose to either use a Jenkins server to implement your CI/CD pipeline, or you can use Tekton. And the lovely thing about Tekton is it's serverless. So that basically means, if you've ever used Jenkins before, Jenkins is like a slightly big 
a like four gig of RAM kind of quite a lot of CPU that runs all of your pipelines. Tekton is this tiny little kind of uh, cloud native binary. So, and then whenever you run a pipeline, we just spin up a container for the pipeline and it goes away again. So normally speaking with the Tekton, we're serverless from the CI CD perspective. We're not running lots of big Jenkins servers. If you're a large organization, you might have, I was talking to one organization who had 3,500 Jenkins masters. So that's 3,500 times four gig of RAM and no big disks and blah, blah, blah. With Tekton, we've got virtually no footprint until you actually run a pipeline. Then you run a container for the duration of the pipeline and it goes away again, rather like serverless itself. So Tekton is the serverless CI CD engine, which Jenkins X supports as well, by the way. So if you want to have a serverless CI CD infrastructure, try the Jenkins X Tekton option when you install Jenkins X. It looks and feels exactly the same. It's just there's no Jenkins server anymore. It's using Tekton for the CI CD. So the build PC is going away. That's now Tekton. Uh, and then the serving and the eventing. So the serving is really all about how do we take functions or containers and expose them over HTTP and do elastic scaling. And then the eventing is about how do we bind arbitrary events in a cloudy like world to those endpoints. So if ever you've viewed Lambda, you can do things like, I want to write a Lambda function. So if anybody uploads a new file into a S3 bucket, I want to, I don't know, gzip encode it and make a new file in the bucket for the gzip version. Or if somebody updates a PDF, I want to generate a PNG or if you want to translate files in S3, you can write a function that does it, and you can get your function invoked when an S3 event happens, or a SQS message, or an email comes in, or whatever. So you can basically trigger functions, not just on HTTP, but on any kind of cloud event. So another part of eventing is, eventing is a universal message bus standard for defining events for middleware-ish things like a uh, message on Kafka, a message on SQS, a bucket has been written to, a new Docker image has been created, or in the case of Jenkins, a new pipeline is triggered, or a new pull request has happened, or whatever. So by these events, these events are a canonical standard for how to describe these events in blobs of JSON or YAML, which then get fed into your HTTP endpoint that you can then process in Java or PHP or JavaScript or Go or Node or whatever. So these two things are really, Knative is becoming just these two things. Serving is exposing functions over HTTP, using any programming language you like, using any framework you like. And then eventing is about how do we define the standard shape and API of events, and then we are binding the serving bit to the eventing bit, so that you don't have to write any code for SQS or Kafka or S3 buckets or any of that stuff. You just have to process this blob of JSON with the events inside, right? So, these two things are the, the new kind of um, cloud native event processing thing. It's a way of doing event driven programming by cloud events, right? which is kind of interesting. Uh, from a Jenkins X perspective, we think this is all like cool and awesome tech. We'd like to extend Can Native into the CI CD space so that you could do a, whenever a new release is done, I want to call a function and post the event of the release and what was the pull request and what's the git commit share and where's the release notes and what's the docker image and what's the whatever. So we want to start extending the event space to handle DevOps events, right? Not just there's a file, there's an actual release. What issues were fixed in that release? What were the commits in that release? Who triggered the release? Who promoted the release? When was there a promotion to production? Who merged the pull request? Who plus one did? We might want to write a function that does reporting or alerting or chat or Slack or whatever. So <coughs> we see this as a really interesting space for us, all of us, improving the DevOps platform using event-driven serverless programming as a model. So we can all use any programming language we like. We can all respond to any of these standardized cloud events or maybe less standardized, that's because Jenkins X makes up these events as we go along. You could use those too. They may be not quite standardized, but hopefully we'll standardize them all the time. Um, another interesting side to all of this is there was a recent um, Open Source Foundation started uh, last month, I think it was, called the CDF, the CD Foundation, the Continuous Delivery Foundation. And a bunch of uh, uh, companies joined it at the same time, uh, Google, Cloudbees, uh, Red Hat, I think, Pivotal, a bunch of other people. And, and there was a bunch of open source projects that were the seed to this uh, ecosystem. And so the first projects were Jenkins, Jenkins X, Tekton, and Spinnaker. Now, over time, we're going to be adding more and more projects and making the whole thing bigger and bigger. But the basic idea is we're trying to have a single foundation for the idea of DevOps and continuous delivery because we kind of want 
there's a lot of open source out there that we want to get that open source collaborating together sharing technology when we can and interrupting when we can so it's not just another foundation where we're dumping a bunch of random code we're trying to put devops and ci cd related tools together in the same foundation so we can build really strong bridges between for example spinnaker and tekton as the python engine and jenkins x as the build pack that automates spinnaker so we can start to build deeper and stronger uh, bridges between jenkins jenkins x spinnaker and tekton and over time there's a whole raft of other open source projects that we'd like join the party at some point, like Scaffold is brilliant, we love Canico as a way of building up images, Helm's already in the CNCF, so that's probably off, off the table, but that would be nice one day, um, but there's a whole bunch of other tools, uh, there's something called Fastlane, it's very cool, um, so that's the CDF. Anyways, back to Knative, so Knative is a way you can just install Knative in your Kubernetes cluster, and it gives you a way of writing serverless applications, uh, so that's kind of it, it's just a slightly different way of using Kubernetes, but it does the auto-scaling for you. I'm going to try to do a live demo for something that was working last week and I haven't looked at since. So we'll see how this goes. This could work okay. So I'm in a different cluster now. Let me get my camera up. So I've switched cluster. And if I do get uh, JX get applications, I've got an application that's running already. Oh crap. Well, that's not good. Uh, oh, maybe this demo might not work. Uh, Okay, bear with me one second. Um, I thought that was a cluster. Is that a cluster? Hmm. Let me just pop up my Google Cloud thing. Okay, this might be really quick. Oh, I've been disconnected. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was almost doubting the public cloud there. For a second, I thought the public cloud might be down. Uh, but no, it's my laptop. Okay, a few. Okay. Right, I think I'm back. Okay, let's try this again. Oh, thank God. Okay. <laughs> it was just my laptop. Okay, as you were, as you were. This could work, this could work. So, uh, JS, get applications. So these are the applications I've, I'm running right now. I've got one pod running. And if I do, uh, this is kubectl, which is the Kubernetes command line. Don't worry about the details of what this means. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna look at the running pods, pods of the Kubernetes name for one or more containers, which is kind of a geek joke, because whale is the logo of Docker, and pod is a group of whales. So it's like a geek joke, but don't worry, don't worry. So pod is the name for one or more containers running in Kubernetes, right? Uh, so get pods in, and I'm gonna use the namespace for my staging repository. Uh, and we'll see there's one pod running there. Now I deployed a regular Kubernetes application. So I've done a normal Kubernetes application. When you do a normal Kubernetes application, there's no Knative serve running. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna edit this application using CI CD. And if that doesn't work, we're gonna make a brand new one. Uh, I'm going to do JX edit deploy. So I'm going to edit the deployment strategy. Now, right now, the deployment strategy is use the default Kubernetes stuff. So the default Kubernetes, you don't need to know about this, but the default Kubernetes uses a resource called a deployment that runs N containers. And there's something called a service that does the load balancing, so you can load balance across those containers. So you could say, I want to run three Tomcats, and I want to load balance across all the Tomcats, so every request load balances. <laughs> so you have one resource deployment, one resource service. So that's the normal Kubernetes way. I'm going to edit this and I'm going to do Knative. So I've changed Knative. So what that's done is it's actually edited the source code of my app to enable the Knative flag. So if I then do a git commit, at minus a minus n, enable Knative, uh, which I could create a brand new microservice from scratch. And if this doesn't work, I'll just do that. And if I do JX get activity and watch, we should see a pipeline start in a second, hopefully, if my is still working. What's interesting, by the way, is if this pipeline runs, and I hope it does, because I'm interested this cluster in a week. Um, if this pipeline runs, this pipeline's actually running Knative. Uh, this pipeline's running Tekton under the covers. I'll just see if the pipeline starts. If it doesn't. Push first. Yeah. So, push. Oh, did I? I didn't push, did I? Thank you. Whoever said that, thank you very much. I'll get the next period in. Uh, give it a push. That could be why it wasn't starting. Okay, let me see if anything's gonna happen now. Hey, come on, you can do this. I normally always check a demo before I do a demo, but I didn't have time to really check. Uh, so we'll just see, we'll just give it a minute. It might work. If not, I'll try and create a brand new microservice and see if that works. Oh, it's working, yes! <laughs> so it looks about the same. We're running a pipeline as normal, you know, we're just running pipelines and stuff. 
What's actually happened under the covers is there's no Jenkins server here. I can show you somewhere. There's no problem with Jenkins. So we're running a Tecton, which is this controller that looks for a custom resource called a pipeline. And it looks for this pipeline resource, which is kind of like a, a YAML definition of all the steps in the pipeline. When it sees this pipeline, it creates a new container for each build run. And that container runs for the entire duration of the pipeline doesn't die. Um, so under the covers, this is Tecton triggering the Jenkins X build pack. The same build pack we use for Jenkins. It's the same build pack used for Jenkins and Tecton. But there's no Jenkins server here. You can see it's fairly quick. So it's, in fact, it's much quicker than Jenkins. There's still some Jenkins people here. Um, so you can see we've already done the release. We've released the new version. We've made a Docker image. Um, and we're, we've done the Helm release, and we're about to do the promotion. And the promotion's done the pull request, and we're the pull request as well. So we've done a normal new release of this application. So it's the normal Jenkins X kind of stuff. Um, and then now, notice we've done the pull request now on the staging repository. So we're now testing out the pull request on the staging. And then hopefully that will go green soon. And then we'll promote this new version. Now, what's really happened under the covers is we integrated Knative into Jenkins X because we thought, well, some people are going to want to use Knative as a way of doing elastically scalable services that scale up and down. So we thought, how do we make this kind of easy? So what we did was we thought, well, let's just make it a flag. Do you want to use Knative or do you just want to do normal deployment? So we've added into our Helm charts a flag that lets you switch whenever you want from Knative to normal Kubernetes deployments. Um, to use Knative, you actually have to install Knative. So we have a command, j create add-on, uh, that adds Knative. Um, you can see we've done the promotion, we've merged the pull request, and we're just about to do the deploy. There we go, we've done the deploy. So now we've deployed a new application. Let's see if that works. So just well, let me just clear my screen. Let me do j, uh, sorry, kubectl get pod. I've used the staging namespace, and I'm going to minus w watches what happens in there. Um, and nothing's happened yet. I'll just keep that running and see if anything happens. So what should happen? <laughs> hey, something's happening. <laughs> the demo comes up with me today. This is brilliant. So what's actually happening is the first line was the old deployment, and now what it's doing is it's undeploying the old version, and now deploying the new Kinetic version. Now this might look a bit confusing because you can see it's terminating some pods and it's running a new pod. Let me just kill that and start again and show you the, the result of that. So here we're running one new pod with a funky name. So it's got a funky name. Now, not a lot has actually changed. We've just run a different kind of pod, right? It's no big deal. Um, but the difference is this pod is an auto-scaling pod. So this pod will, after a few minutes, it will kill the pod because I'm not using this restful endpoint. And then once I invoke the RESTful endpoint again, it will scale it back up again. So it's the same kind of stuff we saw before. The difference is this is using Knative auto scaling now. So if I do um, JX get application, same kind of thing. I get to see all my applications, how many pods are running, what's the version that's running and everything. And if I click this URL, hopefully this will actually work. So there we go, it's working. And then if I do, if I leave this, okay, now this, this is a slightly boring bit of the demo, because it's actually running the pod, I have to wait for it to kill it. <laughs> so I can show you it scales back down again. So we have to talk amongst ourselves for a few minutes until <laughs> it realizes I haven't invoked this restful endpoint, and then it will auto scale it down again. So if I leave that running, and I'll keep talking about other stuff, at some point we'll see that pod die. I forget what the timeout is, it's like a few minutes. So we can do questions in a second, and hopefully at some point that pod will die. Then I will show you there's literally no pods running, then I will invoke the restful endpoint again, and you'll see it scale back up again. So I'll, I'll do a very slow demo of scaling down and back up again. Um, meanwhile, so that's basically it. It's Knative is very similar to normal Kubernetes. You just have to run the Knative um, load balancer -y microservice -y thing, and it watches these slightly different Kubernetes resources. It's a Kubernetes, it's a Knative service rather than a Kubernetes service. And that's basically got auto scaling baked in. So it scales up and down dynamically. So you don't need to worry about that stuff. It just does it for you. So that's basically Kinetic Serve. So on that point, while I have a sip of beer, any questions? Go for it. Uh, the default type of service, can it stop it? So is that The default type of service, can it stop it? The code? Uh, sorry, the code Sorry, I'm with you. The code stop, yes. And, and does it pick up the most of the service providers? Yes. Basically the same. So one of the challenges with serverless is, um, so the issue with cold startup is, if you're using something like Go or Node, it starts up in like a couple of seconds. If you're using something like Java, it can take a little while to get going, especially if you're using like Hibernate and various other things, it can take like 20 seconds. So there is a thing about, 
cold stuff. If your thing has been scaled down so there's no container in it at all, and you hit the service, you have to spin up a new container. You have to wait for that container to warm up and be ready to take requests. Now, cold startup is an issue for a lot of apps. Like a lot of people say, we can't have a web request that takes more than a second ever on production because we want speedy, fast response. I mean, their seconds probably even way too long. It's like half a second. So, a lot of your microservices, you're gonna, you don't want to scale to zero, and you can just say, don't scale to zero. Scale to like one or two or something. So, even when you've got auto scaling, you, for some things, depending on how how long it takes to warm up, you're probably not going to ever go to zero. Um, it does depend on the trade-off. Some people, if this is a infrequently, but well, if this is a, a function that's invoked when a S3 bucket file is written, who cares about cold startup? It doesn't really matter. If this is your home page of your website, you don't want to be scaling to zero. You always want to have like 10 containers all the time, so there's always plenty of, uh, always available things. It is one of those decisions to make on anything serverless. How important is the, is the warm up time? The warm up time is kind of the same, really, between Amazon Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, Azure Functions. It depends on what your code is doing. If your code is a Node.js application that on startup loads a bunch of data from the database and it takes 10 seconds, you can't really do much about that, apart from reactivating your code. So you have a separate cache that is close to you and it's fast enough to get the data from, and so you don't do that load on startup. So cold warm and cold startups is a big issue for all of us, for all of our apps, right? It's something we need to think carefully about. Um, but generally speaking, you can configure both in Amazon and Google and Microsoft and in Kubernetes, you can configure what's the min and the max. So you can say, only scale down to two, or scale down to one, I always leave one running just in case. And it's up to you to make those judgment calls, really. Um, but it is a concern. There is one of the traditional things that I've been worried about Java for quite a while on the cloud. Java on the cloud tends to be quite big and quite slow to start. Which if you've got an elastically scaled website, you kind of don't want a 20 second delay while, uh, while you know, Hibernate goes, I think the database is what it should have been 30 minutes ago. Um, so startup time can, can be expensive. Um, so I'm, I've been a big Go fan of late because Go is like tiny, makes little binaries, starts up really quick, and it's got low footprint. There is a lot of work in the McGraw ecosystem. This is a total tangent, but McGraw ecosystem <coughs> has been statically compiled Java to a small, quick startup binary that starts up in a millisecond and not 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. Um, but it, it is a worry for apps that if your app is taking a long time to start, you can't really auto scale to zero. If you've got a Node application or a Go application, those usually start instantly, usually. So you can go to zero for those. Um, but it, it's a it's a suck in the seat. It depends on your app. It depends on how user facing it is. It depends on how critical it is. Um, it is a worry. Yes. Good question. Yes, it's, it's definitely something to be quite worried about. Any other questions on anything? Jenkins text, serverless, Knative, containers, CI/CD, anything at all? I probably talked way too long. I apologize. Yeah, but That's a great question. And this demo hasn't auto scaled yet, so I'll, I'll, I'll show you how it works. So, w one of the things we use internally in Jenkins X, and this is implementation detail, you don't need to know about this to use it, but we, um, I need to create a new shell uh, and make it a bit bigger. Oh, it's terminating. Oh, right, I'm queue. Oh, 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 that's awesome. So, uh, let me just finish this demo and then I'll finish your question. So, you see it's terminating the pods. So, if I quit that and I do get pods, Oh, it's still terminating. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk amongst ourselves while it actually terminates. So any minute now it will really terminate. And then there'll be no pods running. I'll do QCT, I'll get pods, and there's just nothing there. Okay, let me answer your question, and we'll come back to this, because it might take a few more seconds. Um, by the way, one thing about Kubernetes, is, uh, well, it's the same with serverless and the covers of uh, Kubernetes, is there's two hooks in Kubernetes that are really important to understand when you start doing real Kubernetes stuff. It's something called a liveness check, a liveness probe, and a readiness probe. And these two things are really, really vital. The liveness probe is a way of saying, is this process alive? Is it still healthy? 
For example, some applications deadlock on JDBC deadlocks or whatever, or get caught, they caught on, or they stop listening to HTTP requests, or they get into a funny state where they uh, call them or do weird kind of stuff. So there's a lightness check that just kind of pings your app. You define how often to ping and how frequently and how to ping. But you can just do a, usually it's a HTTP request, but it can be a command that you run in the container, whatever it is. But it's a way of going, you still alive? Are you still alive? If you use something like Spring, Spring has health checks built into the Spring Boot Actuator, so you can say, check I can talk to the database, check I can talk to RabbitMQ, check I can write to my file system, check I can, whatever the thing is I need to do in my app. So your health check can uh, tell Kubernetes, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. If ever the database becomes inaccessible, you can say, oh, I'm not alive, I'm not alive. If ever the lightness probe fails, Kubernetes will basically restart the process. Because often, when things go bad, we just restart it a few times, try that. If it restarts don't work after some period of time, it's like, crap, maybe it's this machine. Try it somewhere else. So we'll restart it somewhere else. And if that fails, it just goes, oh, that it's screwed. So liveness probes are a great way of automatically restarting processes if they might have gone bad, which often apps do go bad. So let's just restart stuff again. But readiness probe is a little bit like a cold start thing. Readiness probe says, is the process actually ready to take a request? Imagine your Spring Boot application takes 30 seconds to initialize, hibernate, and load a bunch of stuff it's data from the database, and get all, open all the JDBC connections and the JMS and the whatever, whatever. So it might take 20, 30, 60 seconds to be really ready. And then you might go, oh, it's still not ready yet. Let's really warm the cache with loads of data and whatnot. So it might take you a while to be really, really ready. So you're super fast when the request comes in. You can decide what the readiness check is. And the readiness check means, are you ready for load? So not are you alive or dead, it's are you warm enough so that when a real request in comes from a user, is everything ready to just go boom and get a request right back? Because what we really all want is, when you hit our website, 100 milliseconds, you've got the answer. You don't want 30 seconds of, you just got high with it, just set up, and then we'll get back to the end of just, we want snappy websites. So the readiness check, we should always put readiness checks in all our apps. Now the readiness check, you only add warm pods into the readiness check. So it's not quite like your cold start with question, but the readiness check is a way of only having the load balancer use warmed containers. And you define what warm means, which is really kind of cool. But anyway, I'm getting slowly off topic. So we have no pods now, I hope. Yes, no pods. Let me just do a quick, let me finish my demo. Oh, it's still terminating. Okay, I'll go back to your question now. Uh, how do we know where the environments are? If I do JX get environment, these are all my environments. And these are all the Git repositories. Now Jenkins X extends Kubernetes with custom resources in Kubernetes. So what that basically means is Kubernetes has this highly available store of state of what apps do you want to run? How many, what's your auto scaling policy? How many services do you want? What's your DNS ingress name? And all this kind of logical metadata. All these resources are stored in a REST API. You can query with REST. There's a command line, kubectl. So when I do kubectl get pods, that's querying the REST API in Kubernetes to ask for information. <coughs> this command jx get end, I can actually use kubectl, which is the upstream Kubernetes command line. I can do get end again. And it returns similar data because Kubernetes understands Jenkins X environments. They're integrated into Kubernetes. I can do kubectl, I get rid of this, it's a fairly lot of commands, ctl, oh, my keyboard's come, keys come up. Uh, kubectl get end. I'm going to try to avoid T's now. Uh, and I'll do staging. Do staging. And I'll do minus O YAML, which is going to output the result as a YAML file. And it's going to empty my terminal. Yes. If I do that, this is the Kubernetes resource that's stored in Kubernetes that defines the Kubernetes staging environment for my team. Now, don't worry, this is implementation detail. We're not really expected to look or know about this, but basically this describes what's the Git repository that stores the state for the staging environment. This is the promotion strategy, automatic. This is the Kubernetes namespace that this maps to. And this is the kind of environment, because we have different kinds of environments, development environments, permanent environments, preview environments. There's various kinds of environments in there. So all of this data is just right there in Kubernetes. So anybody can query this and process this in any programming language with any tool, because it's just right there in the REST API you can just query. So that's how we know when our pipelines are running, this is how we know which Git repositories to do pull requests on. Because we know we've just released one or two or three, which environments does this team promote to next based on the automatic provisions or manual provisions? Does that answer your question? 
that's a bit confusing is that the, the promotion and the releasing are completely separate. So with Jenkins X, I can promote RabbitMQ, Postgres. We're not releasing, I mean, we might be, but we're probably not releasing Postgres or MySQL. Those are upstream things released by other people. So we can promote anything from any team to any environment. All promotion is doing is saying, take this version of this Helm chart, Postgres, RabbitMQ, MongoDB, MySQL, Elasticsearch. Take a version of that Helm chart that's in some Helm chart repository with some version and promote that into an environment. So imagine you've made a Helm chart. Imagine all of you in this room have made a Helm chart with a version number or some random thing. Any of us can promote any of our Helm charts into any of our repositories whenever we want by just running it as a command like JX promote. You just do JX promote, name of the Helm chart, name of the version, and it generates a pull request. And if that pull request goes green, it will promote the Helm chart because Helm charts are, think like Docker images in Docker registries or Maven artifacts in Nexus. Helm charts are in public repositories, so anyone can install that app in any cluster whenever you want. So the act of promotion, we can promote anything from any team. So you, you can promote my artifacts, your artifacts, anyone's in this room. It just so happens, and this is maybe why it's confusing, by default, we assume that if you're a team and you create a new uh, release, you're probably going to promote it to your staging. But I could promote your version to my staging whenever I see you've done a release, right? So I can see you do a release code, well, I'm going to promote your version too. Um, so anybody can promote anything anywhere. Uh, there's a question, I forgot where the guy's gone, about uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, there you go, sorry. Like, you can type JX promote RabbitMQ to staging, and it will just promote RabbitMQ from the public Helm chart repository of RabbitMQ or HackerMQ or whatever you want to do. So you can promote any app of any kind, whether you built it and you released it or someone else did, right? Which is really cool. But normally, the team that releases it is the team that deploys it. So normally, you'd release it and then you'd probably promote it at the same time. There's another interesting thing that imagine we're all in one organization together and we're all grouped into two pizza teams. So we all got, I don't know, four microservices each or something. If we're all consuming the similar microservices from each other, we could all be promoting your microservice into all our environments so we can use it. We could do that, but then that means we need to know when you do a release and why you do a release and things might go weird. What's easier is we might just want to link to your service you're running. So there's something called service linking where you can say, I want to use your team's services, but I don't want to promote your stuff. I want you to promote it whenever you want because it's your stuff and you're running it. I just want to link my microservices to yours. So whatever your production version of your microservice is, my microservices should talk to yours. So there's a thing in Kubernetes called service linking, which means in my production, I can have a service link to where your namespace is. So my app thinks it's running your service in my namespace, but it's really linking to yours. So we can all keep going fast and you own your microservices and you release them whenever you want and it's your business. We can then link to your service and we can both go quickly independently kind of thing. So it, it, all this stuff is kind of confusing because there's lots of ways we could do this, right? So we can all run each other's microservices everywhere. We could compose microservices together into bigger Helm charts and then release the bigger thing. We could keep everything microservices and release them independently. So there's a lot of different ways we can do this. And it's one of those kind of things in some ways, you can kind of experiment yourselves and try a few different ways and see which works for your team. But the quick answer to your question is anyone can promote anything in any environment whenever they want. All you need is access to the chart repository where the charts live. So think like Docker repositories and, and Docker images and Helm charts and Helm chart repositories and Java and Nexus. It's the same kind of idea. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Last question. Last question. Yeah. This is uh, the service link. Yeah. 
That's the scary thing with service linking, yes. Which is why a code review of that change is a good thing. You can say, I'm going to service link, and you go, let's just check that there's where some stuff. So service links are good about at the same time. However, you could do simple governance by saying, all of our prediction clusters are going to end in the namespace prediction, and all of our staging clusters are going to end in staging. And then we could say, I'm going to fail a service link if it's got prediction in the name in a, in a staging namespace or vice versa. So it is really scary. Like anything's scary, right? That pointing at different databases is scary because it could be the wrong one or whatever. So there's lots of scary things if you write it. It's scary, but there's lots of simple labeling, naming things you can do that says, let's have a canonical name for production, let's have a canonical name for staging. So we can do simple you know, CI check that goes, I'm not going to allow you to serve a link to a production namespace in a staging repository or vice versa. So that's a simple CI check, right? That, so I'd like CI to filter those things out. Yeah. There is the whole service mesh world as well, which is even more kind of wacky and stuff, but uh, we're increasingly doing more A-B testing and, and uh, canary releasing and all those kind of things where we're starting to link namespaces together in production, which is scary as well, but if it's done well, it's great, but it's one of those things you have to make sure it's done well. Uh, but for example, we want to do canarying. So we might want a new feature that we don't want it to be live for everybody. We just want it to be live to 1% of users or early adopters or employees. And that's the common one. Let all employees see the new version of production before everyone else. And we give this canary just a time to kind of, does it still breathe in the day? And if it's still alive and you haven't killed the canary, then yeah, everyone else can have it now. So those kind of phase rolls out, rollouts. The good thing is, you can set up your canary statically, so you do it once. You can say, this is my environment for, for canaries, this is my environment for early adopters or beta testers, and this is my environment for everybody else. And you can just promote through them. And you're not dynamically doing a service link, you're just moving versions through environments. So it's much less scary. So with canary, you can make it a little less scary. But yes, we have to be careful. Surface, you're right, service link can be scary. So thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry I talked so long. I will try to be more brief next time. I'm here all evening if anybody wants to ask me more questions after the talk, but thank you very much for Thanks so much.